So today in uh, over two classes, I will cover HIV AIDS and the program. So now I start with the epidemiology part of it. So this is the status in India, the most recent data in 2019 that shows that estimated prevalence in all adults was 0.22%. And in adult males, it was 0.24%. In adult females, it was 0.20%. And the state differences were highest was in Mizoram, Nagaland, and Manipur, that is the northeastern states, and these were the prevalences. And total number of people living with HIV AIDS, so that is PLHIV is said in short. And so when you see the prevalence, you think that it is so small, a negligible amount, 0 0.22, then why are we so alarmed about it? Why do we give so much of focus and prioritize this? so much this is because of few reasons first of all that it is a fatal disease so naturally it is very alarming so always priority are those which are fatal different different uh, criteria are there for prioritization out of that one is that fatal and secondly the population group that is affected so here it is the productive population that is affected most so that is another criteria for prioritizing it so much and say thirdly is once infected an individual remains infected for life so that means this group of population we say people living with hiv and gradually they develop they go into the different stages of the disease i'll talk about that in later part of the session and uh, so what happens is they because since it is a fatal illness in the terminal stages there is a lot of problem they have and they require health services, health care. So that is quite a burden on the health status. So and this number of people, absolute number of people continues to increase. So even though the prevalence is so small, 0.2%, 0.22%, it translates into a huge number. So you can see 23.48 lakhs of people living with HIV AIDS in the country. So that is definitely an alarming situation. And Maharashtra showed the largest, highest number of uh, pale HIV. And here you can see that the age groups are group affected. 15 to 49 means the productive group. So when this group is affected, they are incapacitated by the disease and they have terminal illnesses and ultimately they die. So that tells on the economy of the family, community and country. So it is a really alarming situation. So here you can see the HIV estimates in India, the prevalence uh, since it was detected in the in the early 1980s and how it rose and then it peaked and we have a very good program. So it has gradually been able, we have been able to stabilize it and bring it down. So this is the picture visually you can see now it is coming down. So phases of HIV epidemic. So you understand that it's a comparatively newer disease. So what happened is when it was identified in the beginning. Sorry. So in the beginning, when it was identified, it was in the high risk group of population that is commercial sex workers men having sex with men or that is the homosexuals and the intravenous or injectable rather drug users so these were the groups of population who were affected then what happened that there were some bridge population who carried it back from these uh, high risk population to their partners so this bridge population is for the CSW MSM it was the clients who or their partners and for the injectable drug users other drug users form the bridge population so in the phase two second phase the bridge population were also affected so here other drug users means earlier days when this we are talking about this initial phase that time there was no no concept of disposable syringes there were glass syringes and needles which were being used and these were sterilized and further used so unless they, uh, these are sterilized properly they will carry the infection to others so that is how other users or medication also so they became infected 
Then in the third phase, this bridge population, naturally they carried it back to their partners. They became infected and their partners were also infected. So this is the phase three. That means the general population who have low or no risk. And then finally in phase four, the children were born, the infected mothers. From them, the infection passed on to their children also. So the children became infected. So these were the phases and ultimately now, of course, it is in phase four and it took around a decade to pass from one phase to the other. So this is how the uh, epidemic spread all over the population groups. So types of HIV epidemic. So it is seen that different areas, different regions have different levels are in different condition. And so accordingly, it has been uh, term, uh, graded as three types of epidemic. That is generalized HIV epidemic, concentrated and low level. And here also, again, we can you can see two groups of population, pregnant women and high risk group. So why two different population? Because it is seen that for other diseases, you know, by and large, it is the same. Prevalence is more or less same within a same range in different groups of population. But here it is quite different in the general population and the high risk population. So that is how it has been categorized into two parts, like two groups of population. One is the high risk group, which are you have seen. There are three different main high risk groups. That is the commercial sex workers, the MSMs and the IGOs. So and the general population is represented by the pregnant women said so to be a surrogate population because why is pregnant women taken to as representative of general population? Because for understanding HIV status, you have to test the blood. And if we go out testing blood, asking for blood to test to the people, so they won't. Mostly people will not be willing to do that. And there will be volunteer bias. So you have had your statistics classes, you know, sampling such type of sampling, voluntary sampling, that is not a very good type of sampling because they will be biased. And in which direction the volunteer bias will go, that also we are not aware of because those who have high risk, they might think, okay, this is an opportunity for me to get tested. So many people come and get this themselves tested. So in our sample, we find a very high prevalence. Or it may be the other way around, that is, the high risk people, they feel, what if I get tested and everybody will come to know and with the stigma attached or, attached or maybe with the apprehension that what if I get tested, they don't report. So in that case, prevalence will be very low. So this is not a very good way of testing. So that is why what is done, what was done in the initial phase is that pregnant women, they for their antigen checkup, they, they go through blood tests and their blood is taken for multiple tests. So out of that, a small proportion of blood is taken and that is tested for HIV. So in our country, by and large, the women folk, they have, uh, they do not have a promiscuous life. It is more, it is oh, that uh, because of the social stigma and the social, I shouldn't say stigma, because of the social values, cultural values. So this is not usually seen. So pregnant women are said to represent the population who have low or no risk. So that is why they are considered as a surrogate population for finding the HIV status, HIV prevalence in the general population. So now coming back to these types of epidemic, you see in generalized epidemic, HIV prevalence is consistently over 1% in pregnant women. So this is the cutoff, 1%. This is the cutoff for general population. So that means it is very high in general population. It is more than the cutoff. So that means it is a very high alarming situation. Another stage is the concentrated HIV epidemic where the uh, prevalence is over 5%. This is the cutoff for the high risk group, 5%. So it is over 5% in at least one defined subpopulation in the high risk group. So that means either CSW or MSM or IDU, it is over 5% in any one group. But it is below 1% in pregnant women. So that means in high risk group, it is very high alarming. But then in the general population, it does not still become so high. And low level epidemic is where in both the groups, it is less than the cutoff. So it has not exceeded 5% in any defined subpopulation in the high risk group. And of course, in general population, that is pregnant women also, it is less than the cutoff, that is 1%. So this way, the epidemic has been uh, classified or graded. 
So accordingly, classification of states. So when what happened is initially when the disease was detected in our country, ICMR conducted a survey, and according to the prevalence, the states were classified into different groups, different status. So high prevalence states were where HIV prevalence in antenatal women is one percent or more. So you understand from the previous one, it is generalized HIV epidemic, more than 1% in antenatal women. Then moderate prevalence states were where HIV prevalence in antenatal women was less than 1%, but more than high, uh, 5% in high risk group. And that is concentrated epidemic. And low prevalence states in this condition of low level epidemic there, it was less than 1% in antenatal women and less than 5% in high risk groups. So this is in our tabular form I've given. So in high prevalence states, in ANC, it is more than or equal to 1% and HRG more than or equal to 5%. That means both above the cutoff. In moderate prevalence states, it is less than 1% in ANC group, but more than or equal to 5% in high risk group. And in low level uh, epidemic, low prevalent states, it is less than the cutoff in both the groups. So accordingly, the states were classified and this was the picture. So high prevalent states were the southern states and some northeastern states. So that is Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Manipur and Nagaland. And uh, moderate prevalent states were Gujarat, Goa and Pondicherry. And the rest of them, the states were in the low prevalent category. But it was seen that within the states also there were districts which were high prevalent. So here you can see high prevalent states. These are the districts which are low prevalent districts. And so that is no problem. This categorization is done for prioritizing the services. So in a high prevalent services, uh, sorry, high prevalent state where which is a focus point, focal point of service. So if some low prevalent district is also getting the service, it is not a problem. But in low prevalent states, there are high prevalent districts. So that is a problem. So these are neglected. So they are not in priority area, but then they are high prevalent. So it can spill over any time to the adjacent districts and the whole state. So that is the problem. So what was done was classification was now done according to districts. And so this was the categorization into four districts, A, B, C and D accordingly. This you have to remember, memorize, understand and memorize because it, you have to write in your exam. But here for understanding, I'm giving it, uh, showing it in a tabular form. So A category is when in antenatal clinic at any site, it is more than or equal to 1% prevalence. Now the site concept, I'll tell you again later on in the, uh, in, um, in the later part under Sentinel surveillance. So it means that there are different sites taken different health facilities or different different facilities where the survey is done surveillance HIV sentinel surveillance is done so this is a site so there are multiple sites in the whole country so in the district there are many such sites so if in any one ANC site it shows more than the cutoff it is categorized as an A level district A category district so you understand this generalized epidemic so this is A category district that means ANC at any one site is more than the cutoff more than or equal to 1% B category district is when it is less than one in all sites so you mark this word all sites because in any site it is more it will go into A category so B category is all ANC sites are showing less, but in any one HRG site, it is above the cutoff, that is above 5%. So this is the second highest priority. Now the third group is C category district. So here it is less than the um, cutoffs in all districts, uh, sorry, in all sites within the district, and there are known hotspots. Hotspot is an area from where, where there is a chance of high prevalence or prevalence rising. So these are generally like say where the groups of population, high risk group or the bridge population are found. So bridge population are those which carry back, I told you, from the high risk group to the general population. So these are generally a few groups have been identified as bridge population. So one is so basically, these are those who stay away from their family for a long time. So what happened is they go to commercial sex workers and actually they acquire the infection. They might acquire the infection and carry back. So this group of population 
includes long distance truckers truck drivers so who travel interstate truck uh, travel so they are away from the family for a very long time so long distance truckers is a group of population single migrant male that means because of work laborers the migrant laborers or for some other uh, type of job so when single male migrate they are away from the family and then again this risk is there so these are the or prison inmates these are all bridge population so basically in any district where well, right now these are below the cutter but there are hot spots so that means there may be there may be construction site where the, the laborers have they have made temporary habitations shelters and they are staying there and they are away from the family so that means it is a hot spot so they, from there they can spread and uh, say along dhabas there are uh, these uh, refreshment areas so so the dhabas along the highways so they offer refreshment of course but alongside they also there is also the service of commercial sex workers and long distance truck travel so these trucks stop and the drivers avail those services so where these are the villages along highways so these are also such hot spots or there is a red light area in that district so that is also a hot spot so that means we know there are hot spots so any time though these are now less than the cut up they can spread they can flare up any time so this is the c category district and d category district is though is the are the districts which are of lowest priority it is less than the cutoff in all the both the groups and it, there are no known hotspots we know that there are no hotspots in the district or we do not know we do not have any data so this group is of the least priority so this is how the districts have been prioritized so this is a b c d accordingly it has been classified now to talk of the epidemiology you know we talk about it in the uh, context of trial epidemiological trial anyone has any question till now any questions anyone has any questions no chalo i'll continue so agent factors there are two types of hiv human immunodeficiency virus so one and two and both are transmitted with, with uh, by the same routes and both are associated with similar opportunistic infections they are similar but hiv is more common and uh, hiv to one is more common and two is less common two is less easily transmitted and it is less pathogenic also the reservoir of infection are the cases and carriers and the sources of infection source of infection is blood semen cervical and vaginal secretion and also breast milk now the host factors sorry host factors are some behavioral factors so number of sex partners so those who have more sex partners like say the commercial sex workers so they have more chance of acquiring infection because when a, there are a number of sex partners there are, is more likelihood more probability of some being infected then type of sexual act so anal sex is more likely to transmit the infection because anal tissue is more friable and likely to be injured and hence the infection may transmit easily then sex and age of uninfected partner so it has been seen that male to female transmission is more is higher than female to male so when the male partner is infected and the female partner is uninfected there is more chance because semen has a higher load viral load that cervical and vaginal secretions and also the female have a large surface area that is the vagina and especially during menstruation so there may be there will be open blood vessels so there is more likelihood of passage of infection and use of injectable drugs is a behavioral factor that in the host that makes that person likely to Uh, acquire the infection then there are some medical causes that is menstruation open blood vessels are there presence of stis sexually transmitted infections because these are often associated with ulcer so if there, if there is an ulcer there will be open blood vessels there will be friable tissue nearby so through that again there may be injury and open blood vessels through which the infection will pass mm -hmm. then stage of illness of infected partner in the initial stage that is uh, before the antibodies appear the winter period 
viral load is high, it increases. And so that is the time when infection is transmitted, more, more chance of transmission. Then when the antibodies appear and the virus, uh, viral load is suppressed, slightly less. Then after that, the CD4 cell count falls and the CD4 cell count falls and hence the, the immunity is uh, lower and there is viral replication and as a result there is more chance of um, transmission of the infection and breach and skin or mucosa of course open wound is there skin breach or mucosal breach and bleeding vessels are there so more chance of transmission then some social causes have also been social factors have also been seen to be associated one is absence of circumcision so in some communities by social or religious uh, practice cultural practice or religious practice there is the males are circumcised at at young age at in childhood also so when the uh, in it has been seen that in such communities where the males are circumcised the women have there is less chance of transmission and again so cir uh, circumcision seems to be a protective factor and lack of formal education this is again because you understand lack of formal education makes a person susceptible to any disease because they are not aware of the consequences they are not aware of the ways of prevention and they do not know what to do where to go in case they have any problem so again here that is one and persons living away from the family i have already told you about now transmission of hiv so there are three broad ways of transmission. One is sexual contact, so that can be oral sex, anal sex, or vaginal sex. And also the other way of expressing it as that through heterosexual or homosexual practices. Then parenteral, that can be direct contact with infected blood, so transfusion of infected blood and blood products. Or it may be through needles, so that is purposefully by intravenous or injectable drug abuse, or it may be accidental needle stick injuries either in the healthcare providers and also earlier when there was uh, before the biomedical waste management rules came where waste was not segregated and handled and managed properly they used to be strewn around and there were scavengers picking these up and so that is how again injury had happened and through this way the transmission used to happen then vertical that is from the mother to the fetus or the baby so that can happen transplacentally that is during pregnancy or it can happen during delivery passing passing through the vagina or it may be later on also through breastfeeding now efficiency of transmission so this has been seen by research that sexual transmission has 0.1 to 1 percent efficiency perinatal 20 to 40 percent what does this mean that means if there are 100 acts, sexual acts between one infected and uninfected partner 0.1 to 1 or maybe if there are thousand such acts one infected to the other uninfected so there is the chance of 1 to 10 times 10 people will be infected will acquire the infection perinatally 20 to 40 percent that means out of 100 infected mothers 20 to 40 uh, transmit infection to their babies blood and blood product is the most efficient so out of 100 transfusions of infected blood or blood products 90 to 95 percent times the infection will be transmitted so these are the various figures for efficiency of transmission now if you see this figure the roots of transmission in a group of people who are positive so say there are 100 people who are positive so out of that it has been seen 88 people acquired the infection through heterosexual transmission parent to child 5 not specified homosexual is 1.5 infected needle syringe 1.7 blood and blood products 1 so this is because though uh, sexual transmission is very low in efficiency this is the most commonly performed act activity because blood and blood products it is very highly efficient 90 to 95 percent i told you but then very few people are transfused with blood or they are given blood products so 
very few with and that on top of that there is under the blood safety i will talk about that in the later part and so there is mandatory uh, guideline of testing for five diseases testing of blood for five diseases out of which hiv is one hiv hpv that is hepatitis b virus hepatitis c syphilis and malaria so it is mandatorily to be tested hence testing is being done in all blood that is being transfused and all the blood is supposed to be negative unless of course it is in the winter period or maybe it is false negative so that is why the blood and blood product is contributing very less to the whole burden of the transmission and maximum is by heterosexual transmission so you understand how easily it can be prevented by proper ic and proper bcc to for them to develop safe practices we can easily bring this down now this is the natural history of hiv infection so here uh, you see when there is uh, when there is infection the uh, person has acquired the infection so this is cd4 cell and this is the hiv virus so initially the virus increases and the cd4 cell count is very high in the person in the individual and the virus replicates but then the cd4 uh, is able to counter the virus but then ultimately the cd4 falls the virus viral cells they destroy the cd4 cells and gradually the immune system comes down the cd4 count drops to a low level and the viral load increases in the later stages now manifestations of the condition so what happens is that initially it is known as a window period when the antibodies are not there the virus is there in the blood antibodies are not there so high concentration of virus and the person is infectious and usually it takes around 2 to 12 weeks around 3 months to appear for the antibodies to appear and it has been seen that in 90% of cases they test positive within 3 months of exposure but in 10% cases it may be even later antibodies uh, appear even later so within 3 to 6 months of exposure they become positive and so that is maximum that is seen is 6 months of exposure by that time all the people test positive now after this window period the viral load increases and it has been seen that it goes through various stages to ultimately the full blown aids and the virus is transmitted all along the infected individual transmits the infection in all these stages so these are the stages that is initial infection and zero conversion when infection happens and antibodies develop then the asymptomatic carrier state so here no sign of hiv because immune system controls virus production and this first this time the person has no symptoms but again as i said the person is capable of transmitting the infection then the third stage is aids related complex so here physical signs of hiv infection develop and some immune suppression happens so these are more or less general symptoms that are seen that is loss of weight persistent diarrhea persistent cough etc then comes the full blown aids day where opportunistic infections happen and finally the person progresses to end stage disease so opportunistic infections are that means some microorganisms which do not they do not cause pathogenic condition in a, an individual with normal immune status normal immune system but they take the opportunity of the depressed immune status of these individuals and cause the infection and the disease so these are that is why known as opportunistic infections to which the hiv infected people are highly susceptible and that is how they are suffering and in the end they ultimately die so tuberculosis has been seen to the be the most commonly associated co infection though it is not exactly an opportunistic infection because this happens in other normal individuals and uh, those who are not infected by hiv who have more or less normal immune system they also do suffer so tuberculosis is the most common and tuberculosis hiv is a deadly combination and that is why it is given a lot of focus in both the programs for hiv as well as for tb next is oropharyngeal candidiasis this generally doesn't happen in adults but in hiv infected adults with depressed immune system it does happen persistent generalized lymphadenopathy kaposi sarcoma herpes zoster cytomegalovirus retinitis 
न्यूमोसिस्टिस करेनाय न्यूमोनिया टॉक्सोप्लाज्मा एनकेफेलाइटिस स्ट्रिप्टोकोकल मेनिनजाइटिस सेरी ल्यूकोप्लेकिया एटसेट्रा दीस आर द कॉमन ऑपर्चुनिस्टिक इंफेक्शंस दैट हैपन इन एचआईवी इंफेक्टेड इंडिविजुअल्स ओके सो मच फॉर द एपिडेमियोलॉजी नाउ आई विल गो ऑन आई विल स्टार्ट द प्रोग्राम and i'll complete the program in the next class so any questions anybody has here do you have any questions anybody has any questions any questions no questions okay i will uh, start the uh, this one as i said and then i'll complete it later i'll do, go halfway through this Okay any questions no questions Okay we will take 2 minutes break before starting this 5 minutes break okay starting the program now national aids control program so a little bit about the milestone so how it happened so initially this disease as i told you it is a comparatively new disease so what happened is in the us in the early 1980s 1981 that time there were a lot of homosexual people males homosexual males they were reporting with unusual infections like oropharyngeal candidiasis and kaposi sarcoma so unusual uh, syndromes they were coming with quite a few cases a cluster of cases and many clinicians were reporting such cases so on epidemiological research it was found to be this disease ultimately i'm not going through the details of that the hiv disease was ultimately identified and so the it was uh, all the countries were told about it and every country was supposed to identify find out whether it has happened in their country or not accordingly in our country the indian council of medical research started screening of blood from high risk group 
so those days you understand it was quite long back so homosexual uh, males were homosexuality was not so openly identifiable and also injectable drug users that also was not very much in the forefront but commercial sex workers were of course there all you know so they were tested the for hiv and in 1985 86 Uh, the some cases around 5 6 cases from chennai commercial sex workers they tested positive so it was realized that the disease is there in our country also and accordingly 1987 the national aids control program was launched and uh, earlier there was a program always already going on std control program sexually transmitted disease control program so in 1987 this program was uh, launched and in 1992 std control program was merged with this because as you understand the target population is the same the mode of transmission is the same and hence the prevention measures are also the same so accordingly instead of duplicating services this was integrated with nscp as a component of nscp and in the same year considering the importance of this condition a nacco or national aids control organization was set up as a separate wing in the ministry department of health and family welfare and uh, in 1998 this is another milestone so what happened was it was seen that there were some blood donation some incentive used to be given at that time money used to be given to those who donated blood with the idea that they will buy nutritious food and uh, eat and basically to compensate a little bit of incentive to promote this blood donation but it was seen that a group of same people they were continuously coming off and on repeatedly and by that time this disease has was well established in the country and it was seen that these people all tested positive so it was realized that these people were coming for the money and the money they needed for some unaccountable expense which was usually to go to the commercial sex workers or to buy addictive drugs which are quite expensive and so this group was known as professional blood donors because they were coming to earn money from this so this by supreme court order there was ban imposed on professional blood donation so since then no money is being given it has totally stopped and now for blood donation people are motivated encouraged you might have seen that many organizations on special days to celebrate special days they organize blood donation camps etc so this is how blood is acquired now i'll talk about that in detail in blood safety in the component when i discuss that so accordingly 1998 there was complete ban imposed on professional blood donation by the supreme court and then the national aids control program in 92 to 99 it was launched as the phase 1 of the program and with planned outputs 1999 to 2007 phase 2 of the program and then 2004 by that time not only prevention a whole group of uh, plhiv had built up that is people living with hiv aids so now not only a uh, not a uh, preventive component will suffice but we needed curative care also because there were quite a lot of people infected who needed the drugs and the drugs were very expensive and it used to happen quite a section of poor people were affected and they could not afford the drugs and so that is why the free art program was started 2007 to 2012 phase 3 of nscp 12 to 17 phase 4 of nscp and then in 2017 a midterm appraisal was done to identify the lacunae the gaps and the focus which should be modified etc and accordingly in 2017 the national strategic plan was launched so what were the problems that were identified so just a minute two minutes
Okay, two minutes later, I will continue. Okay, so with uh, with the midterm appraisal and over the over the different phases, several problems were identified. So first was that MSMs and IDUs did not receive proper attention. The whole program focused more on prevention aspect and more on not more totally on the commercial sex workers. So MSMs and IDUs problems were not addressed. Second was that by that time, I told you the number of pale HIV needing care and support increased. A big chunk of population became infected and were proceeding to terminals to full blown AIDS and towards terminal illness. So they needed care and support. And a very important problem is social stigma still existed. So people associated this with bad character that is those who go to commercial sex workers they are the ones acquiring it so there was a lot of social uh, so stigma and social they became social outcasts sort of so this was in the earlier days so what happened is uh, they used to hide the condition so they did not come out in the open so like there is social stigma for leprosy also and this stigma was even more this was very high so with a lot of IEC we have been able to control that, but it was seen that it is still there. It is not totally uprooted from people's mind. The stigma still existed. And monitoring and evaluation systems were weak. And the epidemic, earlier it was in the high-risk group. It has spilled over to low-risk group, as I have shown you in the different phases. And as I have shown you, there were high prevalence states from that. It has also gone to low prevalence states with districts high prevalent in, within low prevalence states also. And initially it was, the disease was seen in urban areas, but then the bridge population carried it back. The migrant laborers or the truck drivers who came to urban areas, they took it back and carried it back to their spouses in rural areas. So as a result, the epidemic spilled from urban to rural area also. So this made us realize that we cannot compartmentalize, that is, we cannot focus only on one group of population or only on high prevalence states or only in urban areas. Everything has to be taken into consideration. So the goals, a little bit about the NSCP uh, 4, the last one, that is, it was the goals were to accelerate the process of reversal. You have seen, I've shown you how we have now achieved reversal. So we are coming, it is coming down, the incidence is and prevalence is coming down. So we have to accelerate that reversal. We have to speed up this coming down trend, the declining trend. 
then we have to decentralize program management activities to state and district levels basically that also i showed you that we cannot focus on states national focus we cannot of course and not even state focus we have to bring it down to the uh, district level decentralize it to the district level and synergize with other national programs so i told you about hiv tb being a very deadly combination so the program has to be synergized with the rntcp now named ntep national tuberculosis elimination program basically for the program for tuberculosis then since there is vertical transmission that means mother to child transmission so also the rmncha comes into focus because there will be a component prevention of infection from mother to child so that also we have to focus on so that will be through the rmncha program so this way we have to synergize with various programs so these were the goals and the objectives were to reduce new infections by 50% of 2007 baseline level and uh, of ncp3 and basically new infection so reduce new infection we can do by prevent prevention components preventive services so only with preventive services there will not be any new infection so this targets the prevention component and provide uh, provide comprehensive care and support to all persons living with all plhivs basically so that is the treatment service or curative so this is the preventive component and this is the curative component and here we don't talk about curative because it cannot be cured so we say care and support so basically this type of services so prevent here and diagnose and treat and care and support so under the 12 five year plan new infections were proposed to be brought down to zero there will be zero new infections so that means preventive services will be 100% full proof and there will be no new infections further and comprehensive care support to all to all plhiv so gaps that were found in the program in the vector appraisal was that in spite of all the components of the program all the services it was seen that antiretroviral therapy among infected people was low coverage was low and also in injectable drug users opioid substitution therapy was low so opioid substitution therapy i will discuss it when i discuss the various components of the program so to stop them using injectable drugs so you suddenly stop it they will have withdrawal syndrome so it has to be gradually phased off so opioid substitution therapy has been introduced that is instead of injection it will be given in some other form so but that again it was low level low low use then among mother among antenatal women low antiretroviral coverage for preventing mother to child transmission and also low levels of testing of pregnant women for hiv and syphilis so this also has become a compulsory component that is all pregnant women should be tested for hiv and syphilis because there is a component there is a goal in this to eliminate mother uh, to child transmission of hiv and syphilis but for that testing needs to be done so that is again not being done now in the international scenario arena in 2014 you units released the 1990-90 target so this 1990-90 target is these are the three 90s so these are the goals that have to be achieved so 90% of people living with hiv should be diagnosed and 90% of these diagnosed people should be put on antiretroviral treatment and 90% of the people on treatment should have fully suppressed viral load so these should be achieved so this is the 1990-90 target and in 2016 subsequently 10 fast track commitments were laid down out of which 1990-90 target is one so the mid term appraisal was done in india for ncp4 and uh, accordingly as i told you one national strategic plan 2017 to 24 has been formulated so this is the plan i will start with this today and then i'll stop after some time after, after a few slides the rest i will continue in the next class so the national strategic plan has a vision for paving the way for an aids free india so this is what we 
we visualize that someday we will have aids free india and the mission that is how to do this to have universal coverage of hiv prevention prevention services universal coverage universal care continuum of services that are effective inclusive equitable and adapted to needs so every word is important so first of all prevention universal coverage and universal care support and treatment so that means the program should reach 100% of the target population and the services will be continued there will not be any interruption continuum of services and what will the services be like it should be effective obviously it should be inclusive that means everyone will be included in it there will be no one left behind and equitable that is those having more uh, the, those needing more will be given more focus equitable and adapted to the needs now goal is achieving zero new infections zero aids related deaths and zero discrimination so the group that we have already built up pale hiv we will have but then we will prevent new infections and discrimination i told you there is still the stigma a lot of stigma is still there so zero discrimination we want to achieve so these were the targets um, laid down here so by 2020 the focus of the program will be to achieve these targets so first of all 75% reduction in new hiv infections so naturally everything has to go phase wise today we think of having zero new infection tomorrow we cannot or next year we cannot achieve zero new infection it has to go by phases so first is that by 2020 so we want to achieve by 2030 zero new infections so by 2020 we will have 75 percent reduction in new infections then we will achieve the 1990 90, 90 target by 2020 we will be able to eliminate mother to child transmission of hiv and syphilis and we also will be eliminate be able to eliminate stigma and discrimination on account of hiv so these are the strategies that is prevent uh, detect and treat so for prevention we have to increase coverage of improve, for improved prevention testing and care linkages systematic evidence generation to reach at risk population so how we can reach the at risk population because we have to bring everyone as we had found that word inclusive it should include everyone so we have to find out those at risk population who are infected and we have to bring them into the Uh, treatment can do the care component into the system and retain key population with adequate and appropriate services so once we bring them here into the system we have to retain them so they start taking treatment and then they disappear they do not come they de are become defaulters and so that should not happen we should retain them so various strategies have been designed for achieving all these for preventing the infection so these are here some i will discuss all these in detail targeted interventions for vulnerable population condom promotion sti rti management voluntary blood donation ppt ct for mother to child transmission ic for general population so these individual components i will all discuss in detail in the next class so next is to test so geo prioritized differential approach so those with, who are more at risk at risk population or at risk states so those have to be identified and prioritized then use graded approach to increase hiv testing that means ident and identify new modalities of testing and develop them assess them and evaluate them and implement active use of ic to increase demand for hiv testing that is also very important we find out new modalities we provide these services but if no one avails these services it is of no use so we have to increase the demand for testing so that people come to for testing the high risk people they come for testing so how these can be done for detection integrated hiv counseling and testing centers i'll talk about this in detail vulnerable population and this these groups should be targeted that is vulnerable population pregnant women exposed infants and blood bank blood banks the donors next is treat the third component is treat so accelerate uptake of art 
improve ART retention. I told you those will start, they should continue. And how can we do that? By engaging community and NGOs, non-governmental organizations, private sector, everyone, public-private partnership and community participation. We have to continue this. Then ensure supportive environment to achieve universal access to ART and also address the comorbidities because there are a lot of comorbidities to lower mortality and morbidity. So for this, the modalities, the components are ART centers, link ART centers and centers of excellence, that is the infrastructure, the healthcare facilities for providing these services have to be developed. Free treatment, free ART, I told you. Treat all HIV patients. So this is a change in the strategy. Again, I will talk about this test and treat strategy. That is earlier, there were different criteria based on which treatment was started, but now it has been said test and treat strategy, which is implemented, that is test, and if they are positive, start the treatment. Then mission Sampark, this is to bring back everyone into the loop. I'll talk about this in detail again. Psychosocial support through care and support centers. So all these I will discuss. So these are the ways to implement the program and achieve these. So these were the components of NSCP4, preventive services, comprehensive care, support and treatment, IEC services, institutional capacity building, and strategic information management system. These were the key strategies under NSCP4. So we, I'll discuss all these strategies. That is, those have been consolidated into the uh, prevent, test, and treat. So basically, these are the ones. So I will just touch upon these and then detail every component I will discuss in the next class. Preventive services, intensifying and consolidating prevention services with a focus on high-risk group, on the vulnerable population and on the general population. So the, there are different components, different strategies. So you understand in the high-risk group, whatever the strategy is, it is not applicable to the general population. But general population also needs some strategies because they are also at risk in different ways. Like say blood safety, which is very important. So unless that is addressed, the general population will also become at risk. So there are different components for different groups of population. So these I will discuss. Second is expanding IEC services for general population and for high risk groups with a focus on behavior change. So when we talk about IEC, we have had these classes that is information, education, communication. But we do not stop at just communicating and raising their knowledge and awareness. We have to bring a change in behavior. Like you say, if we talk about say non-communicable diseases, we tell them that it is very important to do exercise, to eat healthy diet. And they understand everything, they, their knowledge is increased, their attitude is increased, they do feel that yes, it is good, but they are not eating healthy, they are not exercising, it's of no use at all. So we have to change the behavior also. So here also you understand, High risk groups, not only IEC, we should not stop there. For general population, we do IEC. And for high risk group, we change the behavior. We focus on behavior change. And also, we should generate the demand in them, the demand in getting themselves tested, demand in coming into the system to accept the um, uh, treatment in case they turn out positive. So their awareness is required, their attitude is required, but along with that, their behavior change and demand generation is also important. Then care, support and treatment. So we have to do all this. Capacity building. This is very important. Build the capacity of the system to deliver these services. So at the national level, district level and facility level, everywhere we will have to build up the capacity and strengthening strategic information management system. So that is also again very important. That is the information management. So we need data and uh, this includes components of, of course, data collection, surveillance and also research. And surveillance is a very important component of this, which I will discuss in detail. So prevention services for the high risk group and bridge population, these are the components. Again, as I said, these each one I will discuss in detail in the later class, next class. So targeted interventions for high risk groups and bridge population. So some interventions, a package of interventions, they are targeted towards a particular population. So these are the population, high risk groups and bridge population. This is in short known as TI, many times 
it is uh, you will come across that ti ti services ti clinics ti package etc so these are a package of intervention targeted towards this group then needle syringe exchange program and opioid substitution therapy for IDUs, injectable drug users. So I talked about that, that they are neglected. This component was not there earlier. So this has been introduced. Then prevention interventions for migrant population. Migrant population is the bridge population, I told you. Now this problem with this population is that they are, they have, they are residents of one place and their destination, that is they work at another place. And in between, they are on transit, they are traveling. So it is very difficult to focus on them, to target them. So this has been, and accordingly, a software, uh, IT information, that also I'll talk about, has been introduced to track them and keep them into the loop in the system, tracking them and tracing them everywhere and connecting them, linking them everywhere at source, that is the village of origin or place of origin, then during transit and also destination, that is their place of work. So this is one component for the migrant group, so the bridge population. Then link worker scheme for high-risk group population and vulnerable population in rural areas. Another is prevention and control of STI, RTI, sexually transmitted infections and reproductive tract infections. And HIV counseling and testing services. So these are the components, the strategies for prevention in HRG, HRG and bridge population. Now for the general population, the prevention services are blood safety, which is very important, PPTCT, condom promotion, IEC, social mobilization, social mobilization, youth interventions and adolescence education program and workplace interventions are also very important. Okay, so rest I will do on the next day and uh, I will show you a short film now from the ministry, from the uh, National AIDS Control Organization. So this will give you in a nutshell the important aspects of the program. You see this film and we will end the class after this. India has a vision to meet Sustainable Development Goal 3 of AIDS Free Country. India has a vision to meet Sustainable Development Goal 3 of AIDS Free Country by 2030. To achieve this ambitious target, the National AIDS Control Program under the aegis of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare is tirelessly working in collaboration with communities, civil societies, development partners and other stakeholders. Over the last few years, the government has taken major policy decisions which are critical enablers towards fast-tracking national AIDS response in the country. To provide enabling environment and stigma-free services to high-risk groups and PLHIV, the HIV AIDS Act 2017 has been brought in force from 10th September 2018. Now it is the legal sanctity given to all people that there will be no discrimination against people living with HIV in any walks of life, in any type of discrimination, that cannot happen, that will be prevented and that. With launch of test and treat policy, now all PLHIV are initiated on antiretroviral therapy, ART, irrespective of CD4 count, clinical stage, age, or population. To augment the effort of this policy, Mission Sampath was launched on last World AIDS Day, to reach out to all those who know their status but are not on ART. As a result of which, ART coverage has been increased from 10.5 lakh to 12.5 lakh PLHIV. The another landmark decision taken by the government is viral load testing of all PLHIV on treatment. 
This will not only monitor the effectiveness of treatment, but will also optimize the utilization of first-line regimen, thus preventing drug resistance. The AIDS control program has gone beyond the business-as-usual approach and has also been launched with full vigor in presence. Similarly, newer initiatives like community-based screening, differential care model, and multi-month drug dispensation have been implemented across to strengthen the service uptake across prevention, detection, treatment, continuum. Recognizing the success of NSCP model of care, which is based on community engagement, the government has decided that RNTCP should also follow the same model for TB prevention and care package to extend its reach and quality of services. Mainstreaming with other key ministries and departments by signing off MOUs and engaging private sector is another critical area where the program has made significant progress in last few years. So far, collaboration with almost 4,000 private sector units to offer HIV testing services, especially for pregnant women, have been done to achieve elimination of mother to child transmission of HIV. Innovative approaches and targeted messaging for creating awareness has shown remarkable results in bringing down new infection. The program is also known for scientific rigor in generating strategic information and surveillance, program monitoring, operational research and data analysis in collaboration with experts from various institutions to gather evidences for future strategies. The National AIDS Control Program has been extremely successful in halting and reversing the tide of HIV AIDS epidemic in the country and embarks on the ambitious goal of achieving fast track targets by 2020 and end of AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. I urge all of you to come together and join hands in this fight against the HIV AIDS so that together we can end the epidemic by 2030. Okay, so the rest we will do the next day. Any questions anyone has? Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to our speakers and all the attendees for this web. Any questions anyone has? Okay, how many of you are present? All those who are present now will get the, uh, get the attendance. Any questions? No questions? Okay, so we close this uh, class today, end the class today now. Next class, I will continue with this.